Palaroga Shark Media. Hello and welcome to Palace Intrigue. I am your host, Mark Francis. A royal source told Us Weekly, whatever the reason for the operation was, it's of a personal nature, and Kate wants to keep the details as private as possible. Perhaps when she's feeling up to it, she may reveal more, but she's not making any promises. Kate says she feels she's entitled to heal and recuperate without all of the frenzied speculation. Neither Kate nor William think her medical records should be for public consumption. She's trying not to pay attention to all the rumours and gossip, and William is doing his best to shield her, but it's distressing. This has been a stressful time for William and Kate, but they're made of tough stuff and are weathering through. There's an unsettling feeling that things are crumbling within the monarchy. William is under tremendous pressure to keep things afloat. Kate's extremely keen to get back to work. This has been one of the most challenging months for Kate as a royal, and she's praying the fuss dies down as soon as possible. A second source tells Us Weekly a few of Kate's senior staffers haven't been able to see or speak to her, and they didn't even know about the surgery until it was announced, so it's caught them off guard. The source claims to us. Kate has just recently started to open up to members of her inner circle about the nature of her operation and recovery process. Only a few people know what's really going on, and they're tight-lipped. Robert Jobson in the Daily Mail writes, Diana bestowed upon her boys a singular charge. You must promise me that you will always be each other's best friends. Back then, the brotherly pledge seemed easy. Growing up, William and Harry were inseparable. They relied on each other in the aftermath of their parents' estrangement and divorce. Robert Lacey also revealed in his book that Diana's friend, Simone Simmons, recalled that the princess also told her boys, never let anyone come between you. Both boys then promised they would keep that vow, and then they went out to play football, Lacey reports. It was typical Diana, direct. She had a way with them, straightforward and firm when needed. Critics of her approach missed the point. They said she smothered them with love, but Diana was molding princes. William and Harry, parents themselves now, maybe understand their mother better, but not enough. The Royal PR machine was trying to course-correct after a very rocky week, with the press being granted an old-style fluff piece about William's adventures. Sporting a smart Navy cardigan, Wills of Wales visited the New West, where everyone sticks together, onside youth zone in Hammersmith and Fulham to witness the newly constructed facilities for young individuals. This marked his first solo appearance following Kate Gate. West Youth Zone, a local independent charity, boasts various amenities including a sports hall, fitness suite, indoor climbing wall, teaching kitchen, performing arts studio and cafe, offering affordable meals. Engaging with young participants, William took part in various activities including shooting hoops with a basketball in the indoor sports hall and decorating biscuits in the teaching kitchen, participating in a pluck unveiling ceremony to commemorate the occasion. Palace Intrigue will be right back. In the Daily Mail, Ephraim Hardcastle wonders, has Prince William's nose been put out of joint by Queen Camilla deputising for King Charles while he recovers from cancer? Hardcastle writes how in addition to taking centre stage at the Commonwealth Day events on Monday, provisional plans have been made for her to represent him at the Chelsea Flower Show, the D-Day 80th anniversary commemorations, Garter Day, Royal Ascot and Drooping the Colour. William has apparently indicated his willingness to help but hasn't yet been called upon. The long tradition of monarchs being wary of their heirs continues. The depleted royals went to the races. The Queen graced the prestigious Cheltenham Festival on Style Wednesday, marking one of the event's most anticipated days. Her Majesty adorned an elegant emerald green coat paired with a brown skirt and printed blouse crafted by designer Anna Valentine. Accentuating her ensemble, she adorned a cherished horseshoe-shaped brooch. Following the exhilarating race, Her Majesty graciously presented the coveted prizes. Accompanying the Queen at the festival was the Princess Royal, enhancing the day's glamour on what was formerly recognised as Ladies' Day. Zara Tyndall captured attention with her sartorial choice, donning a sleek pinstripe trouser suit, complemented by a toolbox-style hat, while her husband Mike coordinated in navy attire, complete with a stylish cap. Adding to the royal presence, Princess Eugenie radiated elegance in white attire, sharing warm embraces with her cousin amidst the festivities. Eugenie's husband, Jack Brooksbank, joined in the revelry, contributing to the joyous atmosphere of the day of the races. 
In the standard, Melanie McDonough took a look at the lack of depth the royals have right now. She writes, When the royal family gets to the point where they practically welcome the presence of Prince Andrew to tide them over a shortage of Windsors, you know they've got a problem. And so it was at the memorial service for King Constantine, former king of Greece. In the congregation, there was one king, three queens, two crown princes, princesses, 13 ordinary princesses, nine princes and too many dukes to count. But there was a dearth of royals on the home team. Prince Andrew, who led the group to the chapel with his ex-wife, Princess Anne with her husband, and of course Camilla, whom I can't bring myself to describe as the Queen because that still conjures up the late Queen Elizabeth II. It's starting to look as though the policy of slimmed-down royal family on which Prince Philip was very keen wasn't such a great idea. There is an almost unlimited demand for royals to do their thing, viz, entertain other royals, open things, attend to charity events, but there are not enough to go around. The great thing is that this means we get to see a whole lot more of Princess Anne, who got lots of love after the late Queen's funeral when she wore a Royal Navy uniform, including trousers to bestride her horse. She is famously the hardest working royal, and right now the old battle axe practically has honorary babe status. In this febrile and dangerous world, lots of us would feel safer if Anne were in fact Queen. Failing that, just ratchet up the number of engagements, preferably with the army. But there are only so many events the Princess Royal can take on. Failing her, how about the lesser fry? Some of them were at the service. There's Prince Richard, Duke of Gloucester, a harmless architect, and Prince Edward, the Duke of Kent, who's getting on a bit. A better bet would be Prince Michael of Kent, known for his startling resemblance to the last Tsar of Russia. Murdered by Bolsheviks after his British royal relations regrettably refused him refuge. See the relevant episode of The Crown. If ever a royal is needed to visit Russia, not terribly likely just now, he would be brilliant. Apparently the Russians were taken with him. The only thing is, his wife, Marie Christine, is formidable. The late Queen observed that she was too grand for the Windsors. His daughter, Lady Gabriella, has recently been in the news herself after the death of her husband. But how do they solve a problem like Prince Andrew? While they're on skeleton crew, perhaps the odd village fate will have to make do with the penitent sinner. But never Fergie. Seriously, there are limits. And there you have it. If you'd like to email us, our address is thepalaceintrigue at gmail.com. Please follow us on Spotify, Apple, or your app of choice. I'm Mark Francis. My thanks to John McDermott. This is Palace Intrigue and good times. <laughs>